Hi, welcome to this year's Healthcare Heroes event. Once again, we are doing a virtual panel event in lieu of an in-person um, big charade. Uh, so this is gonna be really fun. We're gonna get to talk to some of our state's best top healthcare executives and be able to kind of figure out what's going on with COVID, you know, year two um, and where we're gonna go in the future. So today I wanna to thank Kiln, who's hosting our space here, as well as some of our presenting sponsors, Roseman University of Health Sciences, Intermountain Healthcare, Merit Medical, and Zavant. Today's panelists are Jeremy Wells, who's the Chancellor at Roseman University, Brandon Newman, who's the co-founder and CEO at Zavant, Caitlin Roberts, who's the Executive Director at BioHive, Lori Weston, who's the CEO at Park City Hospital, and Nicole Priest, who is the Chief Wellness Officer at Merit Medical. Thanks so much for being with us. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into our first question. We are more than a year into the pandemic now. We have vaccinations, some people are returning back to work. Um, so what are some of the changes we've made in healthcare? And then I kind of want to go into what are some of the changes we've made in business. Um, Jeremy, do you kind of want to kick us off there? Sure. One of the things I think we have learned is that the hybrid approach to healthcare or higher education or employment not only works, but can actually be better. And by hybrid, I mean a combination of online and ground. And this is certainly true in higher education. Online education has always in the history been relegated to for-profit colleges or universities. And we've kind of viewed online education with skepticism. But over time, it's growing in popularity. And then the pandemic really forced us to adopt that technology. And what we've learned is that the student outcomes are just as good, if not better, in online education. And also the faculty and certainly the students have enjoyed it and in some cases are demanding it. And, and this is happening at Roseman University. So as an example, all of the knowledge content of our courses, we deliver online and those students can study and learn that material when and whenever they want. And then they come to the classroom prepared with that knowledge to then implement it or practice it or have hands-on experience with it. And that's worked really, really well for us. And so we're excited about that. And also kind of a, uh, a, on a side note, we're a graduate institution. And so a lot of our programs require college chemistry and we've never accepted college chemistry in an online format for that prerequisite. But now we are, and it's because there are some great chemistry courses out there that actually send the student a kit, a chemistry kit, and they perform the necessary chemistry experiments on their kitchen table. And so we now accept chemistry as a prerequisite. But not only in, in higher education, this is also, we're seeing this in healthcare. Two years ago, I, I never used a telehealth service. The pandemic forced me and my wife and my four children to call a teledoc. And we love it. It's convenient, it's efficient, it's a great way for my family to access primary care. And we're also seeing this in employment. Uh, you know, in the past, I'll admit that, that I would sometimes judge employees by how much time they're spending at their desk. How long are they here? Are they, are they leaving at six or are they leaving at five? And my mentality has switched. You know, now we recognize that through telecommuting that that employees can be very productive at home, sometimes more productive. And so my, my frame of mind has switched from uh, a, a work time emphasis to a work product emphasis, where we can see that people can be productive. So those would be some of the, the changes I've seen. All right, so Brandon, what are some of the changes you've seen? The pandemic was a, an equalizer. Um, <clears throat> for the first time in a what I would deem um, industry-wide, we saw uh, providers, hospitals, and finally the payer finally saying, we need to come up with something new. The old way of doing things wasn't really working. And so we saw um, an onslaught of interest in saying, how do we work together? How do we collaborate? How do we align? If we're going to solve a, a massive issue, a pandemic that was worldwide, then we had to start doing something together. So the alignment was the first step. We saw dependence on data. All of a sudden we saw shifts in utilization and, and care episodes that we'd never really seen altogether. And so with that onslaught of data, we started seeing all, all uh, I guess, stakeholders starting to work together around data in real time, which is something we've been seeking for a very long time and kind of forced us to, to enter a new territory we didn't have before. 
Sorry, I see you nodding your head. Do you see that as well? Yeah, definitely. And, and as you know, similarly, as he mentioned, you we had to start working together to figure things out. There wasn't a playbook or anything to follow when the pandemic hit. And administrators, physicians, nurses, we all had to come together to really figure out how we, we, we were gonna keep our team safe and our caregiver safe, right? The, the patients coming in. And it really forced egos out the door to have people come together and really try to figure out and, and really be agile, right? There wasn't, a, there wasn't a right or wrong answer. It was, it was fail fast and move on to the next thing until you got it right and you figured out what worked. And Caitlin, what about you? You've seen that a lot of businesses actually really grow during this time. So what was what were kind of some of the impetuses behind that? Yeah, I, I have to, you know, thank Utah Business for highlighting, you know, our healthcare heroes, you know, the, the folks on this panel for all the hard work, our healthcare workers. Um, this has been such an incredible time. You know, that point about agility, we did see a lot of that in industry. Even in Utah, we had over 50 companies, you know pivot their businesses, whether it was into completely outside their core um, competencies and, you know, work to either source PPE, um, to test PPE, uh, develop COVID tests. So we saw a lot of resiliency within our own companies to really say, what can we do? How can we throw into this and really try to support our own healthcare system? So we had a ton of, you know, frontline healthcare workers that were really just sacrificing themselves. And we had people working around the clock, you know, in, in, in industry, I think, trying to support this effort however they could. So I'm really proud of how Utah, I think, stepped up throughout, you know, the entire, you know, our entire workforce to try and grow, you know, be resilient, which in, in a way tests us for the next health crisis in how we can, um, be smarter, be, you know, adapt in faster ways. Um, and, you know, hopefully there isn't one, but, you know, I think being realistically, you know, we've gotten bruises from this, but in a way um, we've learned a lot about how, how we really do come together um, as a state. Yeah, I think um, we just wrote an article, Life Sciences Companies Raised $1 billion in capital across 10 IPOs last year in Utah. So that is humongous. And I know recursion drove a lot of that and also some of our other companies. So we've, we've seriously got some major, um, not only life sciences companies growth here, but talent of life sciences individuals growing in the state. So that's really interesting. Um, how has life sciences um, evolved in this last year? How is that industry changing? Do you wanna to speak to that? Well, I would like to comment on the last question that you asked first, <laughs> because um, one thing that um, being a clinician one thing that I am very excited about if we're gonna take some positives from the pandemic is the way that um, clinical medicine has changed, has the ability now to have telehealth visits and just to see the appeal of patients and employees really enjoying that service. I, I understand we can't do everything via a phone call or a, or a in-person, you know, uh, meeting on on your telephone, but it for for something that is quick and easy, or even for all our COVID follow ups, just to see that uh, experience and how it's going to evolve and what we'll see over the next few years, I think is really exciting. Yeah, that's really really awesome. Um, what about some of the ways we've changed doing work? Because I know we talked a little bit about how school has changed, but we've also now, Brandon, some of your employees are working from home. I know a lot of the companies in Utah have switched to remote and are still remote. How is that changing? It, it's an evolving, um, it's a pendulum really. Uh, pandemic hit and we decided, let's ensure everybody's safe, send them home. We don't know what's going on so in, in, in lieu of knowing anything. So let's just send them home and see what happens. That problem you know, started other issues of how do I work from home? Am I safe from home? Is my data safe? Is the fact that my neighbor's kid coming over to the house uh, a HIPAA violation? Yes, it is, by the way. And how do you protect that? That was a, a mess uh, in, in, in large proportions. But as we 
move that pendulum from far over here to over here. We don't want to go all the way back over here. I think learning that the pendulum should be right in the middle that says it's okay to have a remote workforce. I completely was I was completely against it. And and seeing the benefits and the productivity, the way that we came together was really, you know, astounding to me. But what we found is that we're missing the human touch. We're missing physical con connectivity. And so trying to find a uh, healthy, safe way for people to collaborate in person is now our, our latest strategy of saying, how do we get people back? How do we get people productive? And how do we get people having that physical intimacy of, of working together? Yeah, how are we bringing people back? Are you coming back full time? Uh, no, no, not at all. In fact, um, I, I think that we're, we're um, permanently destined to say, let's, let's find a middle ground. Okay. You guys seeing the same thing? We are still working on that. I think some of our positions may never entirely come back into the office. We found that there are certain roles that people are more productive actually doing what they're doing from home. And then we also have people who say, you know, I really miss being in person and having those meetings together. So again, it's, it will be really interesting to see how this evolves in the next few months to year. Yeah, very role dependent and person dependent, maybe kind of different. You know, I'll add that with healthcare, you know, uh, boomers aging, you know, having just more need in not only life sciences and healthcare innovation, but healthcare, we have an opportunity in our state with such low unemployment and, and the fast growth of this industry, we're really outpacing our need in both healthcare and life sciences to where we have an opportunity to bring people into these industries. Um, who have traditionally maybe been either left out or people, you know, there's a lot of people either leaving their jobs, wanting something more stable, wanting something that's, that's sticky. Um, and so, you know, there have been great examples of um, workforce development programs in our state who can, can tie people into uh, larger employers who are willing to, you walk in the door and they will upskill you. Um, you know, I heard from, from one of our large employers in the medical device industry that they are hiring nail technicians uh, just because, you know, they're so good with, you know, the, the tactile, small, uh, you know, needs that they have. Um, but there is a, there's a talent crunch right now. And we're trying, you know, we're trying to be um, creative in where we're finding these needs. You know, uh, there was a program the refugee services had uh, a few years ago with phlebotomists. And so, you know, we're about to take in a large number of Afghan refugees, so we can be creative about where we are finding our talent. And I think we can do it in a, in a number of ways through our, our public partners and also keeping, you know, our talent in state. You know, we want to keep those STEM graduates, our science graduates, all of our graduates, but we want to bring them into these industries that are high growth, where at the end of the day, it matters. I mean, where you're, you're helping improve lives, you're helping either the industries that are going to create those things where at the end of the day, they, they're touching patients, right? So I would just add that on, you know, maybe not the remote work uh, controversy, but um, there is, there's a lot of opportunity here for us to, to keep people in a really fast growing industry. Oh, I love those examples. That's really interesting. And definitely something that we should be doing because there are so many people that we're not taking advantage of. And and maybe we can even hire out of state or we can hire, yeah, like you're saying, these new populations coming in. That's really fascinating. Are there other examples like that where maybe we're, by thinking differently, we're able to see something we didn't used to see before? Along the lines of one of your responses, um, that people have a choice. You see that across every industry, the trucking industry where they're saying, hey, I don't wanna sit in a truck for 18 hours anymore. I'm gonna go find something else. And that is a problem, but, Finding clinicians who thrive in a, an environment that maybe they don't feel comfortable anymore feels fantastic in a, in, in, in our case, a data analysis environment. Having real clinicians looking at data, making decisions for not just payers, but also providers and, and really getting a, a better mix of, of talent and expertise has been a tremendous asset to the, to the market here in Utah, I think, um, and, and to the, to healthcare as a whole. Yeah. Does that makes sense. I mean, even as a, uh, a writer, there's, there's actually not a lot of journalism programs in Utah, and I find it very hard to find writers for Utah business. And so I often look out of state or to, you know, remote writers who can take on a story and do interviews from afar. 
Um, and I think that that is starting to just open up to us more possibilities and maybe people will even, I mean, hopefully people won't take our talent because we have great healthcare programs and everything, but if we can keep that in state, even better, you know, and we certainly can with all these, these innovations. One of the things we've had to do, we have a college of dental medicine uh, with a large clinic with patients coming in and we need a lot of dental assistants and the dental assistant market is very tough right now. There aren't a lot of them out there. It's tough to hire. And so one of the things we've had to do is to hire people without any training or experience and simply train them on the job. And uh, so that's been a solution that we've had to go to. Yeah, is hiring an issue? Because you see that all over the news right now. Is that, what's going on there? It is an issue. You wanna and, talk and about it more? So <laughs> I see I, you all nodding. So I just mentioned you know, dental assistants, but when we try to recruit uh, dental faculty, so uh, into the state, it's tough because it's such a high cost of living now. And the home costs are, are so expensive that it's tough to recruit out of state. We almost have to stay in state to recruit. So that, that's a problem going forward. And I know it's, it's a problem that's observed in the state and one we have to solve, but one that we haven't solved yet. So is that maybe an upskilling opportunity where we need to train people in that field that are local? And what do you think? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, and when it comes to those faculty members, we're, we're having to take maybe some faculty that haven't taught before. They've been dentists, very successful dentists, and help them be very successful faculty members as well. Interesting. We're what? doing the same thing in uh, Intermountain Healthcare where you, we're looking within the organization to see how we train our own into the medical field, you know, caregivers that are on the front lines. How do we offer tuition assistance and get them into the tech programs and into the nursing schools? And how do we support them by um, tuition reimbursement and those types of things uh, to incentivize, you know, the growth in healthcare? Um, it's scary to join healthcare right now, you know, coming in as a nurse. Um, um, bless the, the hearts of those that are just entering the nursing field right now um, and kudos to them for sticking it out and getting in there and, and, and battling this with us right now. But that's what we're looking at is, you know, getting into those student programs to try to identify students. And then um, who do we have on our teams right now that, that want an opportunity to develop into a healthcare medical profession? Are you seeing staffing issues with nurses and everything? Yeah, you are. Yeah, we are. And I think the same, or? I mean, just, just national shortages. Yeah, right? yeah. And so it's, um, we're competing with each other within the state and um, it's hard to even get travelers. A lot of our nurses are even taking travel assignments other places because I mean, the, the wages are so much higher. And so it's trying to figure out and being creative about how do we reward those that are with us and um, also bring in the help that we need um, to take care of our patients. We're seeing uh, at the universities, we're seeing hospitals that are providing scholarships for their non-nurse personnel to become nurses and providing 100%, 50% scholarships and partnering with institutions to build that talent pool. Wow, that's interesting. Is that what you're doing as well yeah. at Intermet? all health systems right now are looking at that and we're looking at it at a state level too to say how do we do this together um, and when we talk about equaliz equalizing everything with health systems had to come together at the same time to figure this out right this is the workforce of Utah and so how do we keep people coming into the healthcare field it impacts us all one of the interesting challenges uh, that higher education faced with the pandemic we knew that there was a crunch and a need for nurses, but in order to graduate nurses, they have to have hands-on clinical experience. And a lot of the hospitals weren't accepting students or were, were pushing back on that because of obvious reasons. And so on the higher education space, we had to resort to uh, simulation. And, and that was a technology that really uh, was important for us to provide our nurses practical hands-on simulated experience. Wow, is that similar to actual hands-on experience? You'd be surprised. There are some, there are some really good software uh, packages out there and there are really good lifelike mannequins as well that, uh, wow. that do lots of different uh, uh, things, including die and give birth and have heart attacks. And so th there is some, some real world experience that can be gained with those mannequins. I'll remember the 
next time in the hospital. <laughs> that's what they're in for. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So are, are you talking they are in person, but with a, some kind of device? Or are you talking like VR headset, I'm in a simulation doing an operation? Uh, so actually, uh, a little of both. Okay. So we do have a physical mannequin uh, that we simulate emergencies with. And then uh, you have to perform the procedures on the mannequin. And we also have a software and, and, and virtual simulation as well that takes place. Now, all that being said, it's still critically important that our nurses and dentists and doctors get that true hands-on experience. And thankfully, hospitals are, are opening back up now to the clinical experience of students. But nevertheless, you know, that's one of the advantages, hidden benefits, if I can say that, uh, of a pandemic is that it, it forces you to change. And whereas there was technology that was always, again, on the periphery, and it's now in the mainstream and much more accepted. Because you had to use it. We had to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, I commend, like, we have academia and hospital systems. We typically, you know, we all operate in our own silos because it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still dealing with, you know, overcapacity in hospitals and, you know, figuring out this new reality in academia. And here, you know, you see this collaboration, even in this conversation of figuring out how to move the needle forward in, you know, both their relative worlds. Like, look at this, like we have yeah. innovation in healthcare. Like you have perfect examples right here. Like that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how are you handling being um, short staffed then? Because it's one thing to try to hire new people, but it's another thing to be operating with a very tiny staff. And you've got high patient ratios, you know, and you have tired staff. I mean, they're tired and, um, but you, you know, they show up every day and you, you, of course, you're looking at your volumes too, to say, you know, do we have enough staff to do the procedures we need to do or take care of the patients that we have safely and still offer that high quality of care. Uh, but yes, it is. It's definitely, it's staffing is definitely a topic we talk about every single day, maybe sometimes two or three times a day to say, can you send somebody our way, right? Especially within uh, a health system, you're looking at other facilities within that system to say, you know, do you have a nurse that you can send up for a couple hours, right? So there's a constant look at staffing and volumes every day. In the short term, We've noticed this in the news and we've noticed it uh, at our university is it's all hands on deck. And again, referring back to the news, you'll notice that there are top executives who are uh, working the front lines of whatever their industry is. And, and we've had to do that as well in the university where we're having uh, people who aren't receptionists or who aren't patient experience specialists that are, that are filling those roles in the meantime. And uh, we are, we're working long hours and we're doing jobs that we normally don't do, but we're making it work. That's the short term. All hands on deck. And our nurses are doing the same. I mean, they're working in ICU, they're working in surgery, they're down at the front door, they're running our vaccine clinics and testing. And um, so it's just everybody is in a different role. They are not doing what they were trained to do when they first went into healthcare. I, I don't think any of us are. Um, so it's been, it's been quite the experience. Is there fear that that will lead to some burnout and then we'll be in an even worse hiring situation? I think we've already seen some of that, right? There's a lot of, um, we've lost a lot of nurses, especially when you look at the baby boomers that only had a few more years till retirement, they're choosing to retire now. Um, we've had nurses leave that don't wanna be on the inpatient acute side anymore and are going to clinics and urgent cares and other, other areas because they don't wanna be in the grind of uh, the pandemic and, and what that brings with it. And so we are already starting to see um, caregivers that are burnt out and are leaving healthcare to do other things. In another short-term solution while we're in this uh, situation, I think it's imperative for the leadership of any organization to recognize the burnout to work on the culture of the organization and make sure it's an enjoyable place to work and then to shower employees with appreciation. I know that's not gonna solve the problem, but it's, it's, it's something. And we need to make sure that the cultures are strong and that there's sincere and real appreciation for these employees who are doing so much. And I, think, I think that extends to us as in the public as well. I mean, we need to be grateful and honor what our healthcare workers and, and 
frankly, the organizations that are supporting healthcare workers are doing as well. It's a constant task, as you say, around the clock. Right. You know, I'm so grateful that, you know, my in-laws are alive still and getting their shots. And I respect if people don't want to get a shot, you know, not making a political statement, but you know, it's, uh, it, it really is, I mean, something I think as public, we need to, you know, say thank you as much as we can. Everybody take the temperature down. We're all frustrated at times, but, you know, uh, to your point, even outside organizations, I think we need to say thank you too. All right, so one of the um, issues we've been facing at a healthcare level is transparency in healthcare coverage and benefits. So what exactly is the problem? And is there a solution, Brandon? I can I start <clears throat> with you? There is a solution. The thing is, we all know what the solution is, and we have to be willing to align. It was part of the great equalizer response of saying, hey, let's hit the reset button. Let's all lock arms and admit to what we have. We have a lot of, uh, of, of dichotomies, and in, in, I don't want to put it in two categories because I know that this represents a big contingent, but let's put it in the uh, providers providing care and those paying for care. I think we could all admit that those that want to pay for care want to limit as much as possible, and those who want to provide want to provide as much as possible. And so that, over the last several decades, has created lots of opportunity for non-transparency to say, hey, let's create um, payment models that maybe not be in the best interest of everybody engaged. Where we saw, and, and we really took advantage of, is to, to look at data in real time. The, the faster we all look at care in, in immediacy at the moment, the sooner we can actually you know, get on the same page. We can get aligned and say, hey, so-and-so needs care. They need the following treatment. How are we gonna pay for that? Let's create a pathway to do so. But if we're making that decision 12 months after the fact, like most payers have been, well, we're making a decision completely you know, uh, dis distant from you know, the actual event of, of care. So. I, I think that that moment of care, there's a, a moment of empathy. If we can create the data points to inform how we pay for the, the treatment, the care, the medication, the, the, the hospital visit, whatever it is, then, then I think that we begin to break down those walls of non-transparency and start working together again. And again, the, the pandemic has actually begun that process and we are breaking down those walls. One of the biggest um, uh, growth centers of, of uh, really in, in uh, healthcare benefits is focused on those providers that want to provide transparent care. And that is now, you know, the fastest growing segment of benefits. So uh, certainly that, that's my opinion how we get there. So is that cutting out the middleman? Or are you still working with the middlemen? There's always middlemen and women and people involved. Um, I, I don't want to suggest that cutting anybody out is the, the methodology. If, um, if the, the right stakeholders are providing value, then absolutely they need to be paid for what they give. But if there is no value, then I would certainly say let's, let's find the fastest pathway to generate the best outcomes at the lowest cost so that uh, you know, we, we can accelerate healthcare the right way. But no, I, don't, I, don't, I would not advocate for getting rid of middle people. It's, it's about getting everybody on the same page. So what would that look like from an end user perspective if, if a system like that was in place? Well, I mean, the system does exist today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, getting on the same page, if someone goes to, for example, the hospital and finds out that they have cancer, well, there's somebody three months down the road that gets this claim in, in uh, a system, usually up to three months, that they find out, hey, someone's got cancer. Well, let's start providing care to them at that point. Well, they've just missed a number of points of opportunity to help that person. So if we could create that care at that moment and get the pay, payer involved at that point of, of, uh, of care, at the point of diagnosis, then I think that we start breaking down those, those elements of, of non-transparency and really lack of productivity. And we are seeing that today, that, is, that exists in a number of environments today. But it, it requires access to data, real-time data analysis. And, the, and in this scenario, then the individual involved can say, I have cancer, this is my treatment option, and this is how much it will cost? Or patient has cancer, you're posed with a $25,000 a month treatment, rather than say, I can't afford that and I'll just deal with it, and then have worse outcomes down the road, let's now have the payer say, hey, I have a way to pay for that. I have copious assistance. Let's implement that right here and now, rather than wait three months when it's already gone and they've decided, I'm not gonna go down the path of treatment the right way. 
So gotcha. those are the ways to be able to accelerate healthcare in the, in the right way to maximize outcomes and, and reduce cost. Okay, interesting. Any other perspectives on this? Maybe from the healthcare side of things? I think we're all looking at those different models, right? Um, it's definitely a mind shift for um, providers, healthcare systems, and insurance, right? And it's doing, it's paying for value. And right now we're not set up um, to do that right now, you know, until we get there. I think, as you said, it does exist today. Um, part of um, Intermountain's business is at risk. And what that means is we pay for episodic care. We pay for that cancer patient or we identify, you know, patients that have chronic conditions and how do we make their life better? How do we help them live well? And it doesn't hurt them financially, right? And so I think we're all looking at how, how do we make that model work where you're paying for a population versus um, just individual fee-for-service charges. So it's something that is definitely being looked at and hopefully we can get to um, eventually. Caitlin, are you seeing any companies who are kind of emerging trying to solve these issues of transparency? There are definitely companies in like the Medicare, I mean, I think it's been popular lately in like the Medicare, Medicaid space, trying to take on, I think like you said, like the risk of a population. And then, yeah, trying to drive down the risk of a population, um, I think, which is kind of what you're talking to. Um, Around, it's usually around a certain population. Um, and I think that's really compelling. And frankly, I think in a state like Utah, where we are very innovation driven and forward thinking, um, and we typically have a younger population, we can be a great sandbox for innovation, even in care models. Um, so again, I think this is where Utah, we have a competitive advantage, even in trying to um, you know, theoretically we could pay less per patient or per citizen in Utah, but maybe provide more care. <clears throat> um, but again, that's, that's more for our healthcare professionals. But again, it always goes back to who can we partner with and how can we be innovative and creative to provide more value for our citizens? Yeah, that's interesting. I once hosted a panel that featured city planners on how you could tweak a city's design to change different outcomes. And one of the things that the city planner of Salt Lake told me was that you can you can literally make a change, like I'm not like Amsterdam, I'm gonna make 30% of road spaces into bike spaces and increase life expectancy by three years because people become more active. And you can just see those tiny little tweaks made at the community level and how it affects the overall population's health, which is fascinating. Um, and brings me to my next question, because we wanted to talk a little bit about social de determinants of health. Um, and in fact, one of you, I believe it was Jeremy, you told me that their, a person's zip code is a better protect, predictor of their health than their genetics. So how are we addressing some of those socioeconomic kind of dis dif differences? If you will? I think what we first need to do is recognize that social determinants of health are real and that as a community, we have a, we have a problem. And by social determinants of health, I mean all of those social, economic, even political processes or factors that determine health outcomes. Uh, some of the, the primary social determinants of health are uh, food insecurity or housing instability, uh, utility concerns, uh, lack of transportation, lack of education, low income levels, to name just a few. And so at, at Roseman University, what we're doing is we're incorporating social determinants of health into our curriculum so that the next wave of healthcare providers uh, understand what they are and that they're able to recognize them. In addition, our College of Medicine has developed a very practical uh, approach to this, the solution. Uh, it's a program called Genesis. And what it is, it's, it's a home-centered healthcare model where we send an interprofessional team into the home. The, the household is really the, the, the smallest unit of care in the United States. And so we send that interprofessional team in, doctor, nurse, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, whatever it may be, together with a social worker. 
And what they do is they go into a home and yes, they, they treat the problem, but then they're also assessing for social determinants of health. And then that social worker can help uh, with those. Part of the problem, and going back to the conversation we had about transparency is, and this is from me, this is my perspective. You know, if I'm sick, I know that there are the resources available. You know, thankfully, United States of America, we have the resources available but it's navigating the system to, to actually access them that becomes quite difficult for me. And you know, when we start looking at uh, people whose English isn't their first language uh, or, or they're in some way disadvantaged, for them now to navigate that system becomes very difficult or they don't have transportation. Um, and so care coordination, I think, is a, a really important solution that we need to look at where we're helping, and that can be a social worker. This does not have to be expensive where a social worker is working with that individual to navigate the healthcare, the healthcare system. But social determinants of health are a real thing and we need to address them. And I'm, I'm excited about what Roseman University is doing with this home-centered healthcare and interprofessional team approach. So you layer the, the approach of providing care based upon social determinants, along with all the data points that you already have, you know what zip code they're in, you know what age they are, they know, uh, you know what their, their socioeconomic situation is. If you layer that data in there ahead of time, then taking examples, Avant created this uh, uh, COVID module that basically would predict whether or not you're gonna get COVID based upon where you're located, based upon where the proliferation of COVID was at, how old you were, what drugs you were on, uh, where you went to, when was the last time you picked your medication up? And we would pinpoint exactly where to get it. We actually have people identifying people um, right out of the gates because of their, their risk score, pull them out and say, let's give you care. So instead of doing a shotgun approach of saying, let's get everybody who has particular social, you know, economic or social determinants, let's use data that in a smart, automated, using AI way to be able to identify exactly who to provide care to. I, I think that there, there's a key part of that in, in, in what you're describing here. Well, and just to state the obvious, uh, preventative medicine is much cheaper for the patient and for society. Uh, and so that that's a good way to go. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I've been watching some of the emerging technologies in the space. I know it's a little bit more difficult in the US because of privacy laws, but in places where privacy laws aren't as significant of a thing or, or kind of barrier where you can actually, I guess there's even a startup in China that can actually predict illnesses people will get based on what they've had in their Amazon shopping cart and what they bought at Costco or you know China's equivalent, obviously, um, based on those decisions that are made on their phone, which is fascinating because we could essentially use that data. It's I mean, <laughs> more here than you think it is. So really? yes, um, there are obviously regulations around what you can use and how you use it, but there are um, allowances of, of using certain data where it is uh, allowed to, to be able to do exactly what you just described. Are we looking at Amazon shopping? Not necessarily, um, but but many of the, the items that we were just discussing. Specifically, you know, are you getting, are you apt to, to take your medication as prescribed? That one component of do you or do you not is the best predictor of whether or not a, a diagnosis like the cancer we talked about, are you gonna survive it well and how expensive is that going to be for the payer? We can predict those models very accurately and help payers pay appropriately and help providers to provide care the right way. Well, how do you find that information out about somebody then? I'm not gonna say about Amazon shopping, <laughs> but how do you there's, there's, there's data out there that we have access to, we have the right to have access to, to be able to provide those, those elements. Interesting. I know we've kind of seen with Recursion, they are doing some interesting things in terms of drug discovery because of that same idea of using the data early on. I've kind of, it does seem like there's a lot of companies in Utah that are kind of in a similar space, would you say, Kaylin? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, all of this is trying to, you know, uh, discover things early, so earlier diagnostic, and then being able to treat people more precisely, um, which is really what you want, right? You wanna be able to intervene as soon as possible and then treat people more precisely for what they have, um, which is, I think, the, the world we're moving into, whether it's, you know, for, recursion is kind of again using the shotgun approach and, and you know mapping diseases all over the all over um, we have other companies that are doing it 
for certain genetic diseases or oncology specifically, but um, you know, always early intervention is better. And then if you know you as a person can be treated specifically, rather than you know whoever the medical trial was for, you know that profile, you know you're going to have a better chance. But to the point of you know um, medication adherence, you know, that's a big problem. Um, and as we as a as a as Utah is changing and our demographic base is changing, uh, you know, the, the recent study came out in the census, like we're growing so fast as a state, mm -hmm. you know, the face of Utah is changing. Our, even our, you know, we have people moving from the North down to St. George as the, as the boomers are retiring, we have new people coming into the state, you know, who we're gonna see in the hospitals are gonna change, what the, the hospital populations are gonna move around and change. And so that really begs the question of, you know, how are we going to manage this? Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned uh, like non-English speakers, like are our providers going to have sensitivity around those issues? Are, we, are people gonna to get to their appointments? Are they gonna know where to go? Are they gonna have the right interface with their providers? So those are all questions about how as we change the state, we're gonna to have to stay in front of these issues. But again, we're an innovative state that can stay on top of these things if we can you know, collectively, I think, get around this and work together. I do think that uh, big data is a solution and uh, we need to encourage that and use that as much as possible and as, as is ethically possible. But at the same time, I, I do think that uh, a home visit is really perhaps the only way, or at least the best way, to really see those social determinants in action and, uh, and to assess the situation. And, uh, and that does, it takes a home visit. You know, I think about, you know, I think about diet, for example. You know, uh, it's very cheap and filling to go to a fast food restaurant. And, and so then sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll give people a lot of vegetables and you sit those vegetables on the kitchen table and what do we do with those? We honestly, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, how do you prepare vegetables? How do you cook them? And, and so there's, there's boots on the ground need for very simple things that can actually do a lot of good, like helping people on how to cook vegetables. I know that's a really simple uh, uh, example, but nonetheless, it's real. And so getting into the homes and, and helping to educate people about those social determinants of health. It's really important. Awesome. Well, I think we're all doing a lot of great things right now to try to you know, get us to a great place. And I wanna talk about kind of the future and what's ahead for us next. But before we do, I do want to take a minute to um, meet our healthcare heroes. We had you know, some great people that we wanna honor this year who, were, who really went above and beyond to help out during the pandemic and this year in particular. Um, and so we're gonna show you a reel of some of this year's winners. Thanks, we'll be right back.
right, welcome back to the second portion of our event today. We're going to talk about the future now and kind of what all of this, this last couple of years has been so strange, what that is leading to now and where we'll kind of go from here. And where I want to start with that is there's bound to be some fallout from all of this and specifically obesity rates, you know, diabetes rates, mental health disorders are on the rise. And what does that what does that mean? What, is, what needs to be done? How can we protect our well-being in the aftermath of the pandemic? And specifically, I want to start with Nicole on this because I know you've got some great insight here. What do we need to do about it? I think that is the million dollar question and how are we going to deal with what's coming? And we know that higher rates of obesity are going to lead to other chronic diseases. We are going to see higher rates of diabetes we're gonna see higher rates of cancer. We're gonna see higher rates of high blood pressure and heart disease and all of these uh, conditions that we know are so costly for healthcare. I was reading, and this was about six months ago, that the average weight gain in the US through the pandemic was 27 pounds. It's going to be higher now if we re-survey people and ask those questions again. And what, what do we do with that? I think the reason why people gained weight is so multifactorial. People were isolated. People were scared. And I'm sure there was a lot of comfort eating and maybe not cooking the healthy meals that they were doing before. We saw takeout orders go up and fast food drive throughs go up. People were afraid to go grocery shopping and things like that. So looking at what we can do, I, I have my ideas and I, I, want, I want to serve the population that I work in by forming some lifestyle groups. We know that if people are like-minded and they have a common goal to get healthier and to lose weight together, to eat better together, to exercise together. So things that we're going to do at Merit in 2022, we're forming walking groups and we're going to have challenges where teams can compete against each other, different buildings and manufacturing line one can compete with another manufacturing line. And so kind of develop that uh, camaraderie at work. We're going to start some lifestyle classes where we can help people that are pre-diabetic or going um, to get diabetes eventually and, and talk about how to eat better, how to increase your exercise and have those um, groups at work where people are working together for a common goal. So those are some of the things that we're looking at that we can do, which is just on such a small level, you know, for our our 2,000 employees locally and instituting that at other locations. But what we can do as a state, I'm really interested to hear other ideas and, and ways that we can come together to make our state healthier. It's gonna be a problem. Yeah, that's gonna affect our community as a whole, our state as a whole, our nation as a whole. Are, are we able to address this at that kind of level? I mean, this sounds like that is gonna have a huge fallout. Going to the, the large level is the mistake. I think the, the, the solution is here. You have to do families, friends, businesses. Uh, what, are, what are we doing? You, it sounds like you're doing a phenomenal job with, with your strategy, but what we do at work matters. You're there for more of your life than you are at home. So how do you create an environment that gets people up and walking, get standing desks for us that are coding or whatever we're doing? Um, we bring in food. So what food do we select to, to, to uh, you know, provide? Um, and do we create a fun, I think you mentioned a, an enjoyable, you know, fun uh, atmosphere. I think that all matters, but it, it starts here. And if we're not willing to say, hey, in our own homes, in our own friend groups, at our own businesses, we're not willing to put the time, energy, and money needed to solve it, then there's no chance we'll have it US-wide. It just, it, it never happens that way. It has to start small and grow out. We have to agree that we're gonna be accountable to this as a, as a problem and accountable to fixing it individually and then holding each other accountable and being empathetic towards individual situations. Stop being political and let's start being loving and, and empathetic. I think that that's the, the way forward in, in my opinion. 
Well, some of this changed naturally as we, you know, we're back to going to grocery stores, we're back to leaving our houses a little bit more often. Is some of that just a natural part of our lives that maybe we weren't getting for some months as we were kind of just in our houses? Helping people lose weight is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a doctor. And so I think unless people really have a, a support in their community, their families, their work environment, it's so hard to do as just a, a person solo alone. They need the buy-in from their family. They need the buy-in from colleagues and coworkers. I, I don't think it will come naturally. I, I just think people struggle doing that on their own. It's very difficult. You know, having empathy and, and focusing on ourselves, but also on our community. I mean, there are so many people that lost jobs through this pandemic, lost family members. And I think there's a collective grieving that, you know, we're still going through. I mean, there's so many people that are, that are, yeah, I just got a call from, you know, a friend who is sick with COVID, you know, now in another state, but people are still sick. Our healthcare workers are still working hard. The impacts are still here, whether they're seen or not. People are still grieving people who've died. Um, so I think as a community, we need to be sensitive to that. And I think just help however we can, right, to get through this. And there's gonna be mental health resources that we need to dive into, you know, wherever we can access them, whether that's, if we have, you know, private health insurance, whether people need to get it through state resources. But I love what you said about, you know, let's be empathetic, let's try to help each other, let's try to, you know, just do what we can in our own, in our own community. It's very top of mind in healthcare right now. Um, being healthy and preventing health is expensive because you're not, you're you're really not thinking about your health care until you're sick or injured, right? And then by that time, that's when it gets really expensive. So people need to invest in staying healthy, eating well. Um, and so uh, at Park City, for example, hospital, we are we've got a live well center, and um, we're focused on growing that, getting people in for you know lifestyle management consultations, getting their goals and supporting them through that process of living well and eating well um, and just consistent follow up um, to prevent disease. Uh, we have an integrated model where we have doctors that will assess behavior uh, needs, uh, mental health needs and physical needs and, and getting you connected into those things a lot of times with things such as obesity, there's an underlying reason. There's other things you need to address before you can get that individual on a path to lose weight. You know, are they struggling with a mental illness? Are they struggling with an addiction? And it's really identifying those root causes uh, to be able to really help them with their, with their health goals. You mentioned addiction. You know, we oh. saw rates of alcohol use go up. I also heard that online alcohol sales were the highest they had seen in some areas ever through the pandemic. And so the aftermath of that, how are we going to help people now recognize that they have developed a substance use disorder and what resources do we have for them? There's just so many questions on how we address this. I think those most impacted by this too are our, our minority populations, our underserved, those that don't have insurance, that need this care more than anyone. And uh, fortunately at Park City, we were just able to um, receive a large donation. And part of that donation is to really get the resources um, to help these minority populations receive the access to care they need and the providers that they need for it. And But those are the types of things that healthcare systems are having to do in order to be able to put programs like this in place because it's not it's not paid for through insurance companies or a lot of the individuals that need it don't have insurance and can't pay for it themselves. Yeah, and I mean, you're talking about the long-term effects. I mean, to the point, like the underserved have been hit the hardest mm -hmm. and it's gonna take them the hardest to rebound even back to mm -hmm. where they were you know, kids who've been, who didn't have access to 
in the internet for remote learning have, are going now to be way behind their peers. Women who've had to drop out of the workforce to stay home with kids. I mean, we've lost a ton of women who were in the workforce. Maybe it's gonna be hard to get them back into a workforce in a state where we're behind in having women in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Like those are gonna be challenges, I think, for us as a community. But again, I think we need to, I, I am really proud of our leaders for even asking for the report from Kimsey Gardner of like, what's the makeup of our state and you know our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like, I don't think that we shy away from tough problems. And so let's look at this and say, who is hit hardest? What can we do to, to bridge those gaps at the state level, at the city level, in our own communities? And let's, let's try to get people back to where they were and succeeding and thriving. But let's, you know, people who were already having a hard time were, were hit the hardest by this. It's interesting because this was certainly an unprecedented time, and yet we must have experienced this before, right? I mean, this collective kind of failing of, of health and mental health, were there periods that we've gone through in the past that we've had to deal with this? I mean, we've been through recessions, we've been through financial downswings, we've, we have had another pandemic 100 years ago. How, were we able to kind of overcome these things before and then, and then come back? Can we learn from our past in any way? Well, I would call this a giant success um, in terms of like fastest time to spin up a vaccine, like mm -hmm. globally getting this out, mm -hmm. the way that our hospital systems have come together, the way that our academic institutions are like pushing students out, training them like with all of these really creative, you know, ways, the way that our, our private industry is, you know, utilizing <laughs> data to solve so many problems, you know. So, I mean, I just have to jump in and say that this has been challenging for everyone, but I look at this and think, wow, the way that we have pulled this off, incredible. Mm -hmm. And it will make us, yes, lessons learned. Next time we'll be even better, but like, this is phenomenal. Um, well, I do wanna talk about healthcare costs, especially since we've been talking about some of these underserved populations. Um, so what are some of the things that are being done to kind of help, you know, to make low cost healthcare more accessible right now? We're you know, we're looking for funding for these services, also trying to price things affordable so people can afford to have those healthy lifestyles. Um, but it uh, it's hard, especially we talk about, you know, our underserved population. Um, it's it's everyone's problem. It, I mean, you could look at that population and say, well, they need to eat right. They need to make better choices. Um, but if we're not taking care of them, we're all paying that cost eventually, right? It is, it's a society problem for us to, to solve. It goes back to the, you know, uh, the determinants of health, you know, those things that we need to address as well in order to address the whole care, healthcare cost of an individual. Really, I, I believe they say 60% of someone's health is dependent on those social, social determinants of health, not necessarily their lifestyle and physical activity. You know, so if you're not looking at those other things, um, it can get expensive. And so um, there, those are the things that we are looking at for trying to get the cost down, drive the cost down. Um, if we're keeping people healthy, we're keeping them from getting illnesses and getting injured. I look at this from a lens of a university administrator, and I think there are lots of things that uh, universities, especially universities that have programs in health sciences that they can do for, uh, for the population. And so for example, our College of Dental Medicine, you know, our dentists in training, they have to have hands-on real experience with patients. And so we have a clinic. And of course, our, our students are supervised by excellent uh, professional dentists. And so the care that these patients are receiving is just as good, if not better, than what they can receive out in the community for upwards of an 80% discount price. And so another thing that we've done is we gave out last year $1.5 million of vouchers, so $250 a voucher to individuals out in the community. Uh, these are people who are are minorities and, and disadvantaged. And so we're giving them that voucher to come in and to receive the care that they need. Another solution, practical solution, is that, again, the College of Dental Medicine has developed a membership plan. And so for an individual for $12 a month, and then $7 for the next family member, then $5 for the next family member, 
you can get uh, all of your dental care uh, accomplished at, at Roseman University. And so there are real solutions that uh, companies or universities can put in place uh, to do their part. And I'm excited by what Roseman University is doing in, in reducing the, the cost of, of that primary care dental care. But there are other things I think that universities can do. I'm, I'm really excited about new degrees and new professions in the health sciences field. You know, a while ago it was physician assistants, um, but they've, they've done great work and they don't have to go to school for as long. They don't have to pay as much tuition as a medical doctor, but yet they can go out in the community and provide great primary care for, for a reduced cost. And, uh, you know, I think we think about nurse practitioners and nurse anesthetists, like there, there are creative ways that we can reduce the costs uh, from some of the employees that we have, some from these uh, caregivers in, in what they're doing. So I'm excited about that. And then I guess the last example I would have is, and I, I mentioned it before, this, this care coordination. If we don't have that, lots of times people end up in the emergency room and it's expensive for them and it's really expensive for the hospital and for societies in general. And so being able to, to help people guide them through uh, the system that we have and getting the care that they need that's not at the ER is really important. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's difficult even for people that are not, I mean, I can't even figure out what kind of doctor I need to go to for different things. It's very confusing and I don't know who has a primary doctor anymore. Maybe I, maybe that's just me. But um, but yeah, there's there's, I think that the industry as a whole, there's a lot that they can do on an individual level. Are, are you guys seeing that as well? Like, what are you enacting? Well, we have an on-site clinic and it is wildly popular. The, the days of utilization are nearly full every day. I think it, we have a great team of providers there from a physician to nurse practitioners to PAs that are taking care of the employees. We make it convenient it's affordable. We offer um, a lot of services like we have flu shots now, we have the COVID vaccine, we offer wellness vis visits and, and physicals and you know sports exams and anything that, that people may need. Any, anywhere you go and see a primary care doctor, we have that at our work site. And use, using a lot of telehealth services, so that makes it convenient. That is one thing we're doing. We also have um, a dietitian full-time who is excellent working with our diabetic employees and other uh, more uh, helping also with substance use such as tobacco abuse. We have a program for that in the clinic. So just trying to look at what, what the needs are and how we can provide those to our employees right there on site. Do you think that that is a role that a, the company should take on as, as terms of, I know where a lot of us are getting our health care from our companies, is that the, the appropriate responsible party? Makes a lot of sense. We mentioned earlier how much time people spend at work mm -hmm. and if they're already there and they can come to the clinic on their lunch hour or right when they're getting off work and can just simplify one less busy thing in their life. What about um, from, what about those that maybe don't, aren't employed by a company or can't get their health care that way? I know there are some, some things being done. I know Silicon Slopes just announced a partnership with the University of Utah to allow health care coverage for solopreneurs, individual contractors, which is interesting because we're starting to see more contracting jobs. Um, are there other ways that we can kind of help out? We do have community clinics um, where people can go get uh, care instead of, you know, ending up in the ER. Um, and again, I think, you know, keeping people out of the ER for their essentially primary visits or something that is urgent, you know, helps reduce costs for the system, but it also helps that person probably get better care. Um, but again, trying to plug people into the right place in the system, but then it's the education process that I think is ultimately really critical. What do you mean education process? Education process in terms of, you know, when to see a doctor, how to get a follow up, um, you know, like, like you said, like primary care, like what's your, what is your touch point? 
yeah. in in our healthcare system for you know when you're ill or when you have a problem and and how do you get a follow up how do you get a prescription like um, being educated on you know what constitutes an emergency for you um, so and that, maybe it's different for <laughs> for different yeah. people right but um, I think it's yeah. important that people feel like they can get care and that they have a place to turn to. Um, what about healthcare professions? How can we get more people interested in joining healthcare related fields? The data suggests that uh, minorities uh, tend not to access healthcare like they should if, if the provider doesn't look like them. And uh, that's not always the case, but that can be a case. And so I think it's really important to, as a university, to admit a diverse class just because I think that's the right thing to do, but there are other reasons as well, and it, it helps the overall health of the community uh, to be graduating students um, who, who in the past haven't been represented in, in those health professions. And so it's difficult because these, these health science professions uh, require a lot of science uh, education in them, and it's tough to crash course teach someone the year before they apply to one of these graduate programs. Really, you have to look at the, the pipeline of preparation. And so uh, one of the things we've been doing is going into high schools to try to educate everyone about the healthcare professions that exist and to help them understand what they need to do and the courses that they need to take. And oh, by the way, it is doable. You can do this and, and to help them see that there's a a real path to success to these, to these great professions that exist. Um, another thing I think we're doing in, in the university realm is that we gotta look at the tuition cost of some of these programs. They're prohibitive, and it's scary to look at some of the ticker price, uh, 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 the prices of some of these programs. One of the things that we're doing at Roseman is, is we're looking at the time it takes to get a degree so right now our pharmacy program is three years. Traditionally it's four. And, and then our, our dental program is four years. In 2023, we're gonna shrink that down to three years so that we can chop off 25% of the tuition. And that's gonna get uh, the students out into their career a year earlier and also uh, reduce their tuition by 25%. So there are, there are things that can be done, but it's a real problem. We need to have a greater diverse workforce in, in the health in the health professions. So healthcare, or the cost of healthcare education is a prohibitor of people entering that field? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, it is. Education in general is probably expensive, but you just made my case for, you know, diversity in STEM education, which, you know, is something I'd love to talk to you about later. But um, I think that's something that we need to be pushing all over the state, but definitely you know, around Salt Lake City where we seem to have the most diverse population and it's growing again to our recent uh, uh, study, but, but then encouraging representation throughout the entire industry in healthcare and life sciences um, because we need to be as diverse as the patients we're serving, right? I mean, to that point, like we're gonna give better care, we're gonna make better decisions, we need to have diversity throughout our entire um, population because it makes us all stronger. You're not forced to be, if you went to school to be a pharmacist or a doctor or a nurse to go in a clinical setting and give care in the same stereotypical way. Yes, you can, but creating more opportunities to uh, influence and provide care outside of that really matters. Uh, our head of technology, our CTO, um, what his, he, his training was in social work. He graduated as a social worker, found out very quickly that he just didn't like the day-to-day, -day, um, uh, you know, talking to one patient at a time. And rather than burn out and just leave healthcare altogether, he went down the data pathway, became a programmer, became a data analyst. Today, he's effectuating change on behalf of 20 million people. So doing those sorts of things, being willing to be flexible to say, hey, instead of being forced down a very specific uh, stereotypical pathway, be, be open and, and consider. I know that we were speaking the other day uh, at uh, the, the award ceremony where um, we talked about pharmacists and the stereotypical role of doling out medication in a pharmacy. Well, we want them in our, in our, in our realm. We want them at, you know, uh, looking at 
hundreds of thousands of patients at a time and say, hey, how do we help them? How do we deal with the social determinants? And I think that that flexibility in Utah is phenomenal at that to say, we're not going to force you down a certain pigeonhole pathway. Let's look at what will work best for you and let's, let's find the best way to, to solve problems by, by leveraging it that way. Awesome. So I want to get to some of our parting words. We're, you know, we're kind of looking out on the future here and seeing, you know, we, we looked at some of the, the benefits, some of the detriments of kind of this past couple of years. What do you see looking forward as being, you know, something you're very excited about in this industry? Maybe we'll start it off with you. Well, I'm excited about uh, our, our newfound commitment to some of these technology platforms that, that we weren't addressing before. And so new ways of delivering services or delivering education. I'm excited about that. Um, I, I'm also, a, a takeaway from me is the importance of accurate information and how we disseminate that information. And so I'm, I'm excited about what we've learned in that space and how we need to be communicating frequently and effectively and with accurate, accurate data. And that's a takeaway that I've, that I've learned as well. But I'm encouraged with how fast we have learned and how fast we have implemented and how we have changed and changed for the better. Awesome. Brandon? For me, and this was a, a surreal opportunity for me to be a part of other healthcare sectors, locking arms and saying, let's go at it and go fix it. I, I think that we're all saying, let's go do that. Let, let's lock arms. Let's embrace each one of those areas instead of trying to compete against one another for the same patient or for the same whatever it is dollar. Um, I, I see the only way forward is for us to find ways to work together in harmony, uh, focused in on the specific end goal of improving health, uh, reducing cost, and, and you know, growing our communities. Awesome. Kayla? Yeah, I, I, I second Brandon's point. I think it was highlighted during the pandemic um, when you know, we had to just drop everything and come together. And um, that was really the, the, the way that we were able to scale and, and in our PPE and our response for patients and, and getting you know, hospitals ready. And I think it was really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, in terms of collaboration for what we can do for the future. And there was a lot of um, tragedy through that period, but I, I think that it taught us that we are resilient and that when we work together, you know, we are so much stronger than just working in silos. And I, I think that that's the best way that we can be even stronger moving forward to the future. So this, I've learned so much on being on this panel and you know, I hope that we can collaborate you know, for the future and, and across industries, you know, just to, to, to take care of patients and to take care of everyone in the community as well. Lori? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is one, as I've mentioned before, we're really agile now. Like everybody, um, you know, we we're not afraid to fail. You know, we can take those chances and get to the right solution quickly, um, make fast decisions. But I think the biggest thing the pandemic um, really opened our eyes to was things aren't really equal and um, accessible as we think that they are. We could provide access and assume that it's equal for all, but we really, um, we really need to look at how we're providing that and how we're reaching out to those that need it most, um, and understanding everybody's backgrounds and diversity and things like that. I think that's highlight a lot of those things that before we thought if we just, you know, we have our clinics open eight to five, people can schedule. Um, <clears throat> And, and how they schedule and how they like to be seen with telehealth and video visits now, and we've got extended hours. Um, people can really access health the way they want to, when they want to. Um, and that was really hard to do before. We, it's a consumer-driven world now. People have choices and um, they wanna be able to access care and take care of themselves the way they choose we're going to them now versus saying, here's healthcare, come see us and we'll take care of you, right? So I think um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the changes that'll come down the road with some of those things we've learned. How about you, Nicole? I think the opportunity that we're all seeing, we traditionally have stuck to what we've always done. 
And this is just such an opportunity to look and say, what is working for us now? What didn't work before? And how can we change and just be better and understand more? We've talked about you know, the social determinants of health, how important that is. It has become so apparent to me through the pandemic mm -hmm that stuff that I was very naive about before, and now I've just had this awakening to it. And, and how can we look at that from our businesses and from our environment and our state on how we can capitalize on really the tragedy, tra tragedy of the pandemic mm -hmm. and um, see the opportunity? Awesome. Yeah, I think that is one of the things that kind of just came out of this panel as a whole is, kind of what is the opportunity. And I think there's a lot there. So thank you guys so much for being part of this panel with me. And thank you guys for watching. Mm -hmm.